Welcome to Toyota Time with Timmy the Tool Man and Sean. Today we have a special guest, my buddy Alex, and he needs a disc brake service. His 2004 Tacoma started making some noise and what we determined was the noise was coming from one of the wear indicator tabs on his front brakes on the passenger side. What we're gonna show you today is how you can replace those pads and then either resurface the rotors or replace the rotors with brand new ones, whether you get them from the dealership or you buy aftermarket rotors. Disc brakes across the board are pretty much the same with all vehicles. They're just gonna be some differences in the way the calipers look and the way they work. Some calipers are gonna have a four piston system. You're gonna have pistons on both sides of the caliper. Some of them you're just gonna have pistons on one side and then the way the spring system works and retaining clips, there's gonna be little differences there too. Also, you might find that the early warning system to let you know that your brakes need replacing, some manufacturers like BMW have a little sensor that plugs into one of the pads and when the brake pad material wears down far enough to where that sensor strikes the rotor, then it lights up a dash light letting you know, hey, you need to do something about your brakes. So even though we're doing this job on a first generation Toyota Tacoma, the tips that we're gonna share with you today would work for pretty much any vehicle. It's just a matter of jacking up the vehicle, supporting it on jack stands, getting your wheels off to expose the caliper and the rotors. Then you gotta get the calipers off of the knuckle, you hang them somewhere out of your way, you get your rotor off, and then you have a choice of either resurfacing your rotors or buying new ones, whether it's from your dealership or from an aftermarket supplier or auto parts store. Disc brake jobs are pretty simple, but a lot of people think it's above their ability and they pay pretty big money to get it done. And it's not necessary. A do-it-yourselfer can easily handle this job. And that's why we're making this video to hopefully inspire and empower you, the viewer, to do this job on your own and save yourself some big money and learn something valuable. With all that said, let's get started with this job. We're gonna get the vehicle jacked up. We're gonna support the vehicle on opposing frame rails with six ton jack stands. We're gonna get the tires off and we're gonna get started. Okay, we've got the truck up on jack stands. It's being supported on both frame rails with six ton jack stands. A place where I like to lift up the front end on a first gen Tacoma or third gen 4Runner is the cross member right underneath the front of the rig. Right here, it's basically the cross member that the steering rack connects to. And so if you're able to get the jack right in the center of this cross member, then you can jack up the whole front end equally at the same time and then get your jack stands in place on both frame rails. For the rear, it's Probably a good idea if you chalk the wheels, but if you have it in park and you have the parking brake set firm, you really don't have to worry about the vehicle rolling anywhere. Either set the brake really firmly, make sure it's in park, and if you want a little bit of backup insurance, put some wheel chocks behind it. All right, we have the wheels off, and you can see now that the rotor's exposed and you got your brake caliper. Now, if you were just doing this because you had a weird sound, and you wanted to inspect what the hell was going on, what was making that sound, then this is pretty much what you have to do. You have to get the wheels off to do a proper brake inspection. So a squealing sound could be what I said, the wear indicator on one of your pads is rubbing up against the surface of the rotor. And I'll show you what one of those wear indicator tabs looks like when we get the brakes off. And then it also could be a situation where you have your brake dust shield and maybe something bent it and now it's hitting the actual rotor making a squealing sound. So that's another possibility for a brake sound that you are trying to figure out. So what you do if you want to determine that your pads need replacing is you're looking at the thickness of the material. On each side you have your pads and so you get in there with your head with a flashlight and you can see how much meat is left of the brake pad because ultimately especially if you want to save these rotors 
You want to avoid going metal on metal. So as soon as you run out of brake material, you'll be going right up against the metal of the pad and you'll destroy your rotors. For those of you that want to save some money and you want to just resurface your rotors rather than replace them, this is pretty much imperative that you don't go all the way to the metal part of the pad and destroy your rotors. This type of caliper system, this has pistons on both sides of the caliper. Sometimes you'll find that there'll only be two pistons on one side of the caliper and there'll be nothing on the other side. I was actually working on my girlfriend's BMW Z3 recently and that's how her brake calipers are set up. There's only pistons on one side and the other side has no piston. So you might find that on your particular vehicle. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna get this brake caliper disconnected from the knuckle. This is the knuckle right here, or knuckle spindle. It's pretty much always affixed to the vehicle with two bolts. And I'll show you those bolts in a second here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna put the key in the ignition and we're gonna turn the wheel all the way left. We're working on the driver's side, so this way it's easier to get to the bolts on this side. And you'll see how that now opened it up to where I have a lot more room to get my ratchet and my socket in this area. When it's all the way like this, you have less room to work. And we'll do the same with the other side, just basically turning it the opposite direction. So here we are on the back side of the caliper and you see you have one bolt here and then you have another bolt up there. And on this particular application on the first gen Tacoma, and would be the same as the third gen 4Runner, they're 17 millimeter bolts. The torque spec for these are fairly high, so you either need to get a pretty big ratchet with some extra mechanical advantage, or you use a breaker bar. And I'm gonna choose to use a breaker bar with a deep impact socket. So we have a big, long breaker bar. It's about a two footer. And we got a deep 17 millimeter socket and my little helper is gonna go lefty loosey, so go up. And that one's loose. Okay, and now we're gonna get on the top one. Okay, both of them are loose. Now I could just either back them out with my hand or if they're still a little bit sticky, then I'll just get on there with a half inch ratchet and spin them out. Once we get both the bolts out, we don't want to be hanging the caliper on this brake line because the caliper weighs quite a bit and it could damage this soft brake line. So what we're going to utilize is we're going to utilize this specialty made hook. This is actually made for this application for doing brakes, for hanging the brake caliper. If you didn't have something like this, you can use like a piece of coat hanger, you can use a piece of bailing wire, any type of wire, whatever. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna probably hang it up onto the spring here so no weight is being put on the brake hose and then it's out of our way to do the next steps. I'm supporting the weight with my opposing hand because like I said, this thing is heavy. So I'm gonna get one of them out and then I'm gonna work on the top one. And you just have to be ready to take the weight of the caliper and not put a bunch of weight on this brake hose when you get the last bolt out. Second bolt is out. You should be able to shimmy this thing off. Hopefully. There it goes. There's a little stuck on there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my hook and I'm going to put it through one of the bolt holes and then I'm just going to hang it on the spring here if I can get this thing in there. See. There we go. No pressure on the line and the hook is supporting the weight of the caliper. Now you're going to notice that this rotor is already falling off. Quite often you're not going to be that lucky. It's not going to come off so easily. So what you do is you have to get some type of plastic mallet or a dead blow hammer that you're not going to mar it up and you have to hammer on this thing. And you can be a little bit vicious with it. You can hit this thing pretty hard. And then finally, after you hit it a few times around the circumference of the rotor, it's finally gonna break free like this. And then you could just slide it off. If you were one of those people that had a problem getting the rotor off, 
a trick that you can use is you could put a little bit of anti-seize on this surface of the hub and this surface right here and then this way even if you're in one of those areas where there's a lot of corrosion because they salt the roads due to ice you'll probably have an easier time getting your rotor off the next time so little anti-seize on these surfaces will help you out here's our caliper here's our two pads and then in here you can see the pistons on this side and then the caliper pistons on this side so what we have to do to make room for the new pads is because the pad is going to have more material than these used pads is we have to compress the pistons and have them fully retract into each side now a brake system is a closed system when your brakes wear the pistons will come out further and further and further and you'll actually see the level in your master cylinder drop say for instance you decided to add a little bit of brake fluid because you saw that your master cylinder was a little low well now when you go to squeeze these to retract them that fluid has to go somewhere and where it's going to go is back to the master cylinder you have to take a look at your master cylinder level and see if you can get away with compressing these without drawing some of the fluid out of the master cylinder because you don't want to overflow the master cylinder and get brake fluid everywhere because that stuff is corrosive and it eats up paint so you definitely want to be careful of your automobile paint you don't want to get it on your paint because it will strip it off let's go take a look at the master cylinder now and see how much fluid room we have in there so here's the master cylinder on his rig here is the minimum line and here's the maximum line so he's currently not at the maximum line so you can grab a medical type of syringe you can grab a turkey baster whatever floats your boat to be able to suck fluid out of here so you give yourself some room to compress the caliper pistons on your calipers so now how do you go about compressing the pistons back into the caliper well i'm going to show you a couple different ways one way is you can just get yourself a little c-clamp and this one actually for this application ends up being perfect i can get it in here and then start squeezing against the old pad you don't have to worry about damaging the old pad because you're replacing it so it's not a big deal so you can do it that way or you can get yourself a big pair of channel locks these are, are pretty mambo size pretty big and you want to open up the jaws to where you can get a good bite on it and then if you're really worried about your caliper like say if you're one of these guys that's painted your calipers and you don't want to mar it up then you can fold up a rag to protect on this side and not mar up your fancy painted calipers so I'm gonna squeeze in and you can see that it's moving and the other side's moving on me at the same time I might have to hold this side too so what you notice is that when I was compressing the one side the other side started going out on me so what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna hold one side with the c-clamp and then compress the other side you might find that happens to you when you have a four piston system so you'll see now I have a c-clamp holding the one side firm to where the caliper pistons can't start coming up as they start applying pressure here the fluid is looking for the path of least resistance and in this case it chose to start pushing the opposing pistons out so now that I have them held the fluid is now going to take the path of least resistance going back to the master cylinder let me compress this side with my channel locks and you're going to see now that this can't move now I'm just going back and forth a little bit getting a more direct push on the individual pistons and that's pretty much fully retracted on this side now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna swap positions I'm gonna put the C clamp over here hold pressure on that now I'm gonna compress this side so okay so now both sides the pistons are fully retracted you can see that the pads are pretty much right up against the caliper letting me know I can't retract them any further now there's two ways you could have done this you could have removed this retaining clip that holds these two pins from being able to fall out and you could have removed the pads first I chose to remove the caliper off the rotor first it's personal preference because I knew I was going to be replacing the pads and I wanted to use the old pads to compress the sides and so I just kept them in place this little clip goes right into 
individual holes at the end of these rods that hold the pads in place. So you could take a little screwdriver or a needle nose pliers and you could pull it out. And then I'll pull the opposite side out. And then this little clip's free now. If you're in the rust belt, you might have a hard time pushing these pins out, but I have a feeling they're gonna come out fine for me, and they are, because we're spoiled in California. So I'm just sliding them out with the needle nose pliers. I've got the spring out now, and then I'm gonna get the top pin out. If you found that you had a hard time getting these out, you might have to take a skinny punch that is a smaller diameter than the hole that the pin slides in, and you can knock it out this direction. And so now we got both pins out, now we could take out both of our pads. Or they fall out for you. So now we've got both the pads out and we have everything disassembled that we need to do the front brake job. So here's what I was talking about, a wear indicator. It's like an early warning system to let you know that it's time to replace your pads. You can see that when the brake pad material, which is right here, wears down far enough, now this little metal tab is going to be striking the rotor, making that squealing sound that you're hearing. And when we inspected Alex's brakes, we actually inspected the passenger side. We're currently working on the driver's side. And it was squealing for so long that it actually broke this tab off. You can see that this side isn't wearing quite as fast as his passenger side is because these pads aren't worn down enough to be hitting these wear indicators and your new pads will come with these as well. So when you're doing a brake job, you have some choices to make. You can take your rotors to a shop that has the ability to resurface them. They have a brake lathe and they take off just enough material to get a perfectly smooth surface or you just go and buy yourself some new rotors from the dealership online or you get aftermarket like say from napa auto parts you can save yourself some money if you do have a good local shop that knows how to resurface them because even aftermarket rotors are going to cost you more than resurfacing them we found a local place to us that we can get these resurfaced somewhere in the 20 dollars per piece range if you get decent aftermarket rotors or you get oem rotors they're going to be closer to 75 to 100 dollars each so you're going to save some money this way now when it comes to resurfacing rotors there's a minimum thickness that has to be maintained or you can't get them resurfaced the place that resurfaces them isn't going to be able to resurface them. It's against the law for them to take the material down further than is written on the rotor. You have to look at the rotor and you have to see where that writing is. Sometimes you'll find it stamped in this location. Who knows, maybe it might be stamped in this location, but the two locations that I've seen so far is I've seen it stamped on here and then it's inside here in between these fins and so there's no way I'm going to be able to show you those letters it's going to be too hard to see but from my own vantage point I could look in here and I can see that it says minimum like it says M I N and then it says T H K for thickness and then it says 20mm meaning 20 millimeters is the minimum thickness so what the shop is going to do is they're going to take a micrometer and they're going to measure this thickness and if they determine that they can resurface it and still maintain that minimum 20 millimeters of thickness then they'll do the job if they can't do it then they're going to tell you sorry you're going to have to get new rotors so alex and i are hoping that the shop we bring it to is going to find that there's enough meat here that they can resurface them but maintain that minimum 20 millimeter thickness so now the next step is we're going to do the same thing with the other side you don't need to see it because you already saw it on the driver's side we're going to get that caliper off we're going to retract the pistons and then we're going to clean up everything with some brake cleaner, get all the parts nice and clean, ready for the reassembly. And then we're gonna drive those rotors to the local shop and hopefully, fingers crossed, we're gonna be able to get them resurfaced without having to spend more money on new rotors. If you found that your master cylinder level was a little high, let me show you what you can do to draw fluid out just so you don't overflow it and make a mess. So right here, I just got a little 10cc syringe, just like your plain doctor 
Not doctor with your sister, you dirty <laughs> <laughs> You put it in there and you draw back and you draw some fluid out. This is also giving you a bird's eye view of what your fluid is looking like. If it's really dark, then you probably want to flush your system after doing this brake job and just renew your brake fluid. If you click on the link above, you'll see how we do a brake fluid bleed and flush to renew the fluid. Take a look at it. If it looks fairly clear, not too dark, you could probably get away with it and not do a flush. But if it's looking pretty dark, probably good practice to renew the fluid because this fluid is just like any other fluid on your automobile. It wears out, it gets dirty, and it gets old. So you might have to renew this if it's looking pretty bad. So see how before it wasn't at the max, the fluid was down lower. And when I compressed the caliper on the driver's side, it's now all the way up to the very top of the max. So this tells me when I do the passenger side and compress those calipers, the level is going to be way, way up. So I know without a doubt, we're going to have to draw some fluid out to make room to compress the caliper pistons on the passenger side. We got the pads off on the passenger side. You can see comparing the amount of pad material this one was the one that finally got down so low that it was making the noise. So for some reason, the passenger side is wearing a little bit faster than the driver's side. Maybe just a little bit of unequal pressure going to that one side of the caliper pistons. You might see the same thing on your rig. It's not anything to really worry about, but you just have to know that there's a little bit of unevenness in the fluid pressure and your pads are probably gonna wear similarly in the future. So the only way you could correct that is maybe getting new calipers or you just live with it and know that you might have to replace pads a little bit sooner than you normally would. In addition to if you wanted to correct an unevenness in your brake calipers, you could also rebuild them. There are videos out there in existence for rebuilding calipers where you put in new seals and you get everything nice and renewed. And so that's another option. For Alex's situation, we're not too worried about it. So we're just gonna put everything back together as is and we're not gonna worry about the fact that the caliper pistons on the passenger side seem to be pushing a little bit unequal, a little bit stronger on the side with a pad that has a little more wear. All right, we're at Tire and Wheel World in Salinas, California. Let's see if these guys can help us out and resurface these rotors for us. This is Mike Spencer and he runs this business with his son, Matt and they've been around for a long time. They've been doing this for three generations. A lot of knowledge here. They do really good work. There's a lot of good employees here, so I trust them with my rig when I wanted to get an alignment, and now we're trusting them to resurface the rotors for my buddy Alex's Tacoma. We'll get there. All right, we're back at Tire and Wheel World and they were successful at resurfacing the rotors for us. And here's Matt and Matt's gonna describe how much material was left and how he resurfaced the rotors. The uh, material that was left was about 22.6. Uh, the minimum thickness for these rotors was 20 millimeters. Uh, I cut them down to 21.1 and 21.2. So they are definitely ready to go. Right on. Good job, Matt. Thank you. And here's the finished product, and you'll see that we have a nice, perfectly machined nice. surface for the new pads awesome. to be running on. Right on. And if you're wondering what oh. the old sun, <laughs> sunny boy looks like, this is Matt Spencer. That's it. All right. Come on, you guys. Thank you. All right. Thank you, you Matt. Put me on blast right there. <laughs> All right. We're back from Tire and Wheel World with our perfectly resurfaced rotors. Now, some of you might be watching this video and say, well, I've actually gotten away without bothering to get new rotors or to resurface them. And that's actually correct. You can, in a lot of occasions, get away with just compressing the caliper pistons, putting in new pads and calling it good because the rotor surface isn't that bad. But if you want the best chance 
of having a non-shuttering brake system where you're gonna get nice, smooth braking, your best bet is to either resurface the rotors or get new ones. Okay, so now we're ready to get everything back together. We've got our resurfaced rotors and we have some new pads. Alex chose to get some from AutoZone. You obviously have choices with pads and with rotors. You can go with the OEM pads from whatever manufacturer vehicle you have or you can go aftermarket. These are like a middle of the road pad and they look to be of good quality so they'll probably last them a long time. One thing to note with these Toyota applications is along with the brake pad, there is two anti-squeal shields. And I guess the last time Alex did the brake job with another friend, they didn't keep those anti-squeal shims. So the two thin shims would go on against the back of the pad. So if you ended up getting yourself a set of Toyota OEM pads and you got the shim kit or you just reused your old shims, what you do is the shim that has kind of the cutout slots, you would take some high temperature grease like this right here. This is made by CRC, brake and caliper grease and you would grease both sides of that shim with the slots in it. Then you put it right up against the brake pad. Then you take the other anti-squeal shim, which is a solid piece, there's no slots cut in it, and then you put that on top of that. And then the pistons of the caliper push against the shims, which are then pushing up against the brake pad itself. So if you had shims, that's where you would be putting them. I decided instead of just talking about it, I would show you what one of these anti-squeal shim kits looks like that Toyota sells. And these would come on your Toyota vehicle. I know for a fact they are on the third gen 4Runners and first gen Tacomas. That's the part number. Let me open up the package and show you what they look like. So you get a set of eight shims. You get four that are solid looking, no slats, and then you get four that look like this. This is the shim that I told you that you put a light coating of the high temperature grease all along it on both sides, and then you made it up to the back of the brake pad. And then you take the other one and you put that one behind it. So the caliper pistons will be pushing up against this solid shim just like that. It also comes with a couple packets of grease. So if you didn't happen to have your own high temperature grease, they provide it for you in the shim kit. So if you're renewing pads on your Toyota vehicle and you have these shims, I highly suggest that you reuse them. Clean them up, re-grease it, and then put them on with your new pads. Don't throw them away because there's a purpose for them there's gonna be a lot less chance that you're gonna get squealing brakes with these two anti-squeal shims with your pads. So we're gonna get our rotor on first. And then what you wanna do is you wanna take a couple lug nuts opposing each other. You wanna get the rotor pushed up against the hub face perfectly square. It's pretty common that you think you got it square but it's not perfectly square. So hit it a couple times. See how this actually popped in for me like another quarter inch, eighth of an inch. I want to make sure that it's perfectly square in there so when I get the caliper on, I can get the pads in really easy. If the rotor is not square, then you're going to have a difficult time getting the pads in. So this seems like it's fully seated on the face of the hub. Now we're going to get our brake caliper in place. So now I'm ready to get the caliper back bolted onto the knuckle. Whatever way you chose to hang it, get that disconnected. I'm gonna take the hook out. So I'm gonna slide the caliper over the rotor, line up the bolt holes on the caliper with the bolt hole on the knuckle and see if I can get this top one started. Okay, that one started a little. Now I'm gonna line up the bottom one. The bolt started, now I'm just going to get them hand tight with this 17 millimeter socket. Supporting the weight of the caliper with one hand while turning with the other. I'm just going to get these bottom out with hand strength and then leave it there for right now. Okay, those are both bottomed out. So now we're going to slide the pads in. You're going to see that it has a little cutout and that little like partial moon shape 
means that that side faces the rotor going inboard because the rotor's round, right? And another dead giveaway is this is where the pins have to go through, so it really could only go in one way. This side goes against the pistons, and this is the brake pad material that goes up against the rotor. So if you've retracted your pistons properly, you should just be able to slide these in just like that. They fit in nice and easy. And same thing on this side. I get the right orientation, and I just slide them in like so. They might be a little sticky, there we go, both sides are in. The brake pads slide on these pins, and so this is where the factory service manual says to put a little high temperature grease. So I'm using this CRC brake and caliper grease, it's a high temperature grease, and I'm just gonna get a little bit on the rod in these spots. You don't want it too much, you wanna make sure it's lubricated pretty good so the pads will slide easily on these pins. The pins slide in, from the outside in. So I have to slide it in first from the outside spot. Then I gotta get it lined up with the outside pad. So a pair of needle nose pliers might help you out. You pull on it to where you get it lined up and then you slide it through. If your kit came with new springs, then you have a choice. You could use the new springs or you could clean up your old ones. The old springs were in perfectly good shape, but since the kit came with new springs, we'll use them. So I'm gonna get the spring in this orientation. So the pin is gonna slide right into the slot. So I gotta place the spring in there and then slide the pin capturing the spring. And then I capture the opposing pad on the inside. And then I have to line it up with this side of the caliper. And this might be the hardest one, but we'll see what we can do here. There it goes, it lined up, and now it's all the way through. So next, I have to get the other pin in, same process. I'm gonna lubricate it a little bit, and I'm gonna slide this one in, same thing, from the outside going in. Now this one has a little hook to it, and I'm gonna capture this part of the spring with the pin also, so I have to push in a little bit, slide it in to where it's capturing the bottom part of the spring and then now that's good and then it looks like I have to pull on the pad here just a little bit to line up the hole that's lined up now I got to line it up with the caliper and that's lined up and it's slid in if you find that you have a lot of excess grease, you might want to wipe it off with your finger or with a rag. You don't want to get any grease on your pads and on the rotor because it's not good. You're going to have poor braking performance. So if you see any big globs of grease, clean that up a little bit. So this is pretty much almost ready. The last thing we have to do is we have to get our little pin retainer clip in place. So again, the kit came with a new clip. So what you do, this little doohickey right here, Chingadera, you lever it in and you capture this middle hole right here and then the pins have a tiny little hole that the end of the clip goes into so you might have to manipulate the position of that hole with the needle nose pliers or other type of tool and get it to where you could easily slide the end of the clip into the hole on the end of the pin you gotta kind of bend it and then fit it into the hole it looks like it needs to re-rotate it there. I think I got it. Okay, so this side is now being captured by this clip. And then now I have to see where this one is lined up. I have to rotate it a little bit, bend this clip, and then line up that hole with the pin. Okay. And then now both of them are captured. So this is a protective mechanism so the pins can't slide out on their own. This little clip is holding those pins from being able to come out. So this is pretty much it. You have your two pads. This is what's called the anti-rattle spring. You have the pads being captured inside the caliper with the top and bottom pins. And then you have the pins being held securely by this little clip. So now that you have all your brake components back together, the last thing you wanna do is you wanna to torque your caliper bolts to the proper spec. On this Toyota Tacoma, the torque spec is 90 foot-pounds. For your particular application, it might be a different number. Consult the factory service manual for your particular make and model vehicle or go search online for the spec. You'll probably find it in some type of form. So I'm just gonna slowly bring these up. I'm gonna give them each a little turn and slowly bring them up to the 90 foot-pound spec. That already hit. 
Okay, looks like we got both at 90 foot pounds. The final step is we're gonna get our tires back on and we're gonna torque our lug nuts to 85 foot pounds. So now we're ready to get our wheels back on. Now, wheels can be pretty heavy. This is a truck and the wheels are pretty heavy. And you could try to bend over like this and get the wheel on, but that's kind of bad body mechanics and you can hurt your back that way. So here's a different way you can do it. You have to get a little dirty by sitting on the ground, but you'll be okay. Just don't wear your fancy Calvin Klein jeans. And you get underneath here and you grab the tire with your hands and you're wedging your forearms against the inside of your thighs. And you get the wheel close and then you kind of push up with your legs and lift and it just pops right on just like that. So no strain on your back whatsoever doing it that way. That's what I suggest. So we're just gonna get all the lug nuts cinched up hand tight and then we're gonna lower the truck to the ground and then we're gonna torque them to spec. Now if you have one of these fancy guns, this DeWalt gun has settings so I could set it to a low setting, I could set it to one and this way I can't really over torque it. So I can just cinch these up with this gun and then I could finish the torquing job with my torque wrench. Okay, we're gonna do the same with the other side. So once you get both your wheels on, the lug nuts just snugged up but not torqued all the way, you gotta jack up the front of your rig and I'm underneath that cross member that I talked about earlier. I'm getting it off the jack stands and then now I'm gonna go and remove each jack stand. With our jack stands out of the way, we can lower the vehicle to the ground. And then now we gotta get our torque wrench out and torque the wheel lug nuts to 85 foot pounds. So I have my torque wrench set to 85 foot pounds and I'm gonna slowly bring these up to spec. So anytime you have bolts in a pattern like this, you want to do a star pattern. So I'm going to go here, 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 here. And I'm going to bring them up slowly. So a little bit of a turn on each one and slowly bring them up to the 85 foot pound spec. Now I'm just going to double check them all. I'm just going to go around the clock. That's good. 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 Good, good, good. That's one wheel done. We gotta make sure we do the other side. And then if you have one of these decorative covers, you just wanna get your decorative cover back on. So it's usually a matter of fitting them over the lug nuts and popping it in and you're good to go. To finish up this job, I wanna double check the level in the master cylinder. We are on level ground and I did suck some out with my 10 cc syringe and after I compress the passenger side caliper pistons, the level is a little bit low. So I'm gonna bring it up to the max. So depending on the make and model vehicle you have, it might be a twist off. This is just a push on type of cap. So I'm gonna get this out of the way. I'm gonna get the appropriate brake fluid for these Tacomas, it uses dot three. There's a good chance that your make and model vehicle might use a different standard. Most of the time, the type of fluid that your system uses is written right on the master cylinder cap. So this says use dot three fluid. So be careful with this. Don't spill it, make a mess. And that's right to the max and we're good to go. All right, we're all done with this job. Brake jobs are pretty straightforward and you would think auto shops would charge very little to do them, but you'll find if you get a quote at a dealership or another type of automotive shop, they want big money to do a brake job. And as you saw, it's really not that hard. A do-it-yourselfer can do this job, no problem. It doesn't take a huge array of special tools. It's a pretty simple job. You get the vehicle jacked up, supported on jack stands, you get your wheels off, you take the two bolts that hold the calipers onto the knuckle, you hang the caliper out of your way, you take the rotor off, maybe it takes a little persuasion with a rubber mallet or a dead blow hammer, you get that off. And then like I said, you have choices. 
with the rotor, you can either buy aftermarket rotors, you can buy OEM rotors from your local dealership, or you could resurface them like Alex and I chose to do on his Tacoma. Or you have another choice and you don't resurface them at all. You just keep the caliper on the knuckle, you compress the pads with some type of tool, try not to mar up the surface of the rotor and then you slide your new pads in with a new spring and you lubricate the pins whatever system you have and then you get it back together my suggestion is you go ahead and either resurface your rotors or get new ones because you're just going to get better braking performance with new pads running on a nice perfectly machined rotor with all that said we thank you for watching toyota time with timmy the tool man and sean and special guest alex Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. If you have any questions or comments, do that below. Take care. Bye-bye. Sick mods. And keep wrenching. Do it yourselfers. Peace out. Bye-bye.